Okay, so I want to make this video to express a long-held opinion that I've had that has very, well, pretty much nothing to do with the most recent Brownlow medal count. And I want to discuss to what extent is the Brownlow medal a, a particularly legitimate award. And I was really conflicted making this video because I'm caught in two minds here. First of all, I, I kind of wanted to let Patrick Cripps' Brownlow medal win uh, breathe for a little bit because I, I felt it was a little bit distasteful to make a video immediately questioning the validity of the Brownlow medal and, and the integrity of it, I suppose, because I do think Patrick Cripps is a deserving winner and I don't actually have an issue with him winning the Brownlow medal as such. On the other hand, I am a content creator. I have an opinion on this that is fairly strong and this is the best time to discuss something like the Brownlow medal. Do I wish I'd released it before the Brownlow? Probably. But I really want to make it clear going into this video that uh, I am not having a shot at Patrick Cripps and him taking out the Brownlow medal. However, I do think even the most recent count has probably unearthed some obvious issues that we have with this award, which is considered pretty much the greatest individual award a player can receive. But it's been my long-held opinion predating True Footy. I remember getting into debates at uni about this, that as an award for truly reflecting who the best players in the competition are, it is deeply flawed. So let's let's discuss that. Personally, like straight off the bat, I've always said, I've always looked at the coaches award as a much better indication of who the best players in the competition are. First of all, there's, there's some straight off the bat, there's some flaws with the Brownlow medal. The fact that it's decided by umpires. Now, I, I know it's unrealistic to campaign for that to change. I think it is too deeply entrenched in our tradition and our history to be revolutionizing the Brownlow medal to take it away from the umpires. It's not necessarily what I'm campaigning for. However, you have to admit, at least in my opinion, that the notion of the game's most prestigious individual award being decided by umpires is problematic to me. When we do have a coach's award who, in my opinion, are much more equipped to be able to assess who the best players on the field are on any given day. There's a number of reasons why. I feel like looking at coaches' votes, they generally not only do they have a better view of the field, like umpires are consistently at the ball drop, right? The, particularly if they're officiating at that part of the ground, you know, when they're balling it up, the, the players that they see immediately in front of them are midfielders. Now we'll, we'll put a pin in that because we can discuss to what extent is that valid as well. Why is it always midfielders winning this award? But there was obviously going to be some sort of bias towards the players that are physically close to you, whereas by contrast, the coaches have a full ground view. I do also feel like coaches are more likely to give votes to players that have done a really good role that day, which umpires are going to miss. And I don't blame umpires for that. They are not in a good position to be able to assess things like that. I do feel like key position players probably do get a little bit better represented. Genuine lockdown defenders, um, potentially key forwards as well. Certainly rucks, uh, although the data will suggest that even the coaches award does tend to go towards midfielders. Like I said, we'll put a pin in that. So not only are they not in a good field position to assess and they've got enough on their mind already, I suppose coaches do as well, but it would be incredibly hard as an umpire to follow who's been the best player on the field that day when you've got such a high pressure on camera role. But anyway, so they don't have a great view. Um, second of all, they're not allowed to use stats. And this has been reaffirmed. I read an article earlier today that suggested that the umpires have in recent times kind of lobbied to be able to have some access to stats after a game. Now I understand the argument against using stats because if we become too stats focused, that will also produce weird results. AFL is such a complicated and nuanced game that even those who do this for a living are finding it hard to truly get a good representation of who the best players are simply on stats. From what I read, there was a bit of a suggestion that perhaps there could be some sort of compromise where umpires will select the five players that they think are the best players on that field, and then they cross-reference it with stats to be able to eradicate any absurd results. And we do have some absurd results. Remember Jason Horn Francis got, uh, what do you get, three Brownlow votes for a game last year where I think he had 13 possessions and like six clangers or something like that. Dacos got three votes, I think. No, he got one vote this year for a 15 possession game, which I think he was subbed out, if I'm not mistaken. And then Josh Dacos, who had 34 possessions and a goal or something like that, didn't get a single vote. So an inability to cross-reference what your observations are with stats will undoubtedly lead to absurd results. And I do think as well, the idea that umpires can't look at stats was probably, and I'm taking a leap here, but I'm pretty confident in it. This would have been established as a principle, as a rule, probably like 
I don't know, how many years ago? When did the AFL like really start recording stats? Was it the 90s? I don't think in that, maybe it was the 80s. I don't know, they recorded the goal kickers, but like disposal counts, that isn't actually something that is an ancient thing that has been recorded in AFL. I'd love someone in the comments to let me know when that was, but I'm going to take a part and say like 80s or 90s. And then when that became a stat, you, the pretty much only the stat you had was probably disposal counts. And disposal counts by themselves are a terrible indicator of who the best players are on the field. Now, we are equipped with so much more data. And like I said, stats are just stats. You do need to be able to cross-reference that with your eye test. I think both are important here, but we have so much more information like meters gained and disposal efficiency, and, and that's just skimming off the top. There is so much more in-depth stats that champion data tracks that you know we don't even get access to, but coaches do and potentially umpires do as well. So I think the argument against even looking at stats is getting weaker by the season. So that's two major problems with the Brownlow medal so far. We've said it's decided by umpires who may not be the, the most legitimate decider of the most prestigious award in the AFL. Second of all, we know they're not allowed to use stats. Thirdly, I mean, the voting system itself is not perfect. I mean, in theory, and this is an extreme hypothetical, but let's say a player was the fourth best player on the field every single game for the year, and the umpires judge that perfectly, he would end the season with zero Brownlow votes. Conversely, a player that is dog shit, <laughs> that's terrible, but let's say a player does nothing for three quarters of a season, but has three best on ground performances, well, he gets nine Brownlow votes. So when you're comparing nine votes to zero, it looks like one player had a much better season than the other. Now, that is probably an argument to suggest that Brownlow votes in general are not a good measure of how good a player is so outside of the winners maybe maybe they do get the winners pretty close and maybe it only matters what's on the top but you know saying okay well this midfielder polled 12 votes this year and this midfielder polled 14 votes that is a ridiculous way to compare midfielders that are nowhere near the top i hope that makes sense outside of the top five the brownlow votes in general as a metric for players and, and the quality of those players it's completely irrelevant so the voting system is not perfect and i do want to explore a couple of alternate voting systems um, for a start coaches award um, they go five four three two one so in theory you get a better spread you could you could have up to 10 players get a vote in a single game of footy and i think that is better although you could make the argument once again that if a player is the sixth best player in a, in every single game for the entire year it is possible they also don't go without a coach's award vote so perhaps that's flawed too but it's probably better than three two one and finally suspensions as well i just want to touch on this i have made this point before but the idea that in the modern game a player can be ruled ineligible for winning the best and fairest award. And I know it's called the best and fairest, but we do need to bear in mind the context of what best and fairest meant back in the day and what it means now. And I think I do empathize with the AFL's predicament at the moment of, of wanting to protect the head and penalize behaviors that will lead to concussions. But we can all agree, I'm sure, that we are now seeing players get suspended for acts that are not necessarily dangerous in their nature, but incidentally cause some sort of head injury. And I do think personally, that is leading to some quirky results where players are ruled ineligible for winning the award when perhaps they don't deserve to. And Bear in mind as well, what Best and Ferris meant, you know, in the 80s. I mean, what did it take to get rubbed out in 1981? Probably actually clotheslining a player. So changing social standards, changing rules and expectations around the way we penalize players for their actions has massively changed. I think that needs to change, although it's not the biggest issue I have with the Brownlow medal. So let's discuss, well, there's a couple of things, right? That, that I haven't mentioned yet. One of them is the fact that it's a midfielder's award yeah, exclusively, really. Um, you know, I think uh, Tony Lockett won the Brownlow back in the day um, as a key forward. Um, but I mean, you think back to 2008, right? And this is one example, but I think it's decent. Lance Franklin had one of the best individual seasons we've ever seen in the modern game. To kick over 100 goals in the way that he did was unbelievable. And yet, Adam Cooney won the Brownlow medal that year. So that's one example. That's one example. Although I will admit... Like I said, the coaches award also tends to be biased towards midfielders. Now, Max Gorn did win a coaches award uh, 2018, I believe it was. So there is a little bit of more diversity in that award. And I think that's good. I think that's good. And perhaps we do acknowledge that maybe these days, midfielders do have much more influence over how good their team is than ever before. This midfielder bias that the Brownlow medal has and you know, to some extent the coaches award as well has become a lot more pronounced in recent times. And partially, I think you can also look at some data and just notice that 
Midfielders are winning a lot more of the footy these days than ever before. Disposal counts in general are getting higher. I mean, what did Tom Mitchell average? Like, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head, but it was like 35 disposals a game in 2018. I mean, you go back 10 years prior to that, and that was absolutely unheard of. So the difference of the amount of possession and ball players are getting is undoubtedly higher. There's also a lot more stoppages, presumably, than ever before. I know the AFL has worked to mitigate this. They want to reduce stoppages, more free kicks, more holding the ball calls. But I'm going to take a punt and say that without checking that over the last 20 years, the the amount of stoppages and therefore ball ups and therefore opportunities for the umpires to look at the midfielders right in front of them is higher than ever before. So perhaps this is just a reflection of the nature of the game. We do need to question though why the gap and the, the total amount of votes is becoming so concentrated on a select few amounts of players than ever before. The fact that Patrick Cripps won 45 Brownlow votes is absolutely absurd. If I'm not mistaken, I think Cuz won in 2005 with 20 votes. Ollie Wines broke the record, I reckon, in 2021 with 36 votes. And Nick Dacos beat that this year. Nick Dacos would have won the Brownlow every other year. And he didn't actually get that close to winning the Brownlow. A seven vote victory for Patrick Cripps is enormous. So this is a clear trend over a number of years now where the top Brownlow vote getters are getting more votes than ever. And, you know, the idea that Patrick Cripps and Lockie Neal have shared four of the last five Brownlow medals, am I right in saying that? The only one other than them was Ollie Wines in 2021. That, that seems like an absurd result to me. I think those are wonderful players, both deserving of a Brownlow medal, at least one. But they've got two each now and could easily pick up a third because there seems to be this absolute, perhaps unintentional bias towards midfielders who are literally at the coalface. Clearance bull midfielders. I mean, Tom Mitchell won in 2018. I don't know how many people were saying that Tom Mitchell was the clear best player in the comp. You still had Dusty Martin running around. You still had, well, we still had Gary Ablett Jr. to some extent. I can't remember how good he was in 2018. My point being that there is a clear type of player that this award has become increasingly biased towards, and they are getting more and more consistent votes than ever. Patrick Cripps had an amazing season, but he did not have a record-breaking season. And if you'd asked, I reckon, not that this is maybe the best measure, but if you canvass the AFL watching community in its entirety, and you ask them who was the best player this year, they might have polled and picked Patrick Cripps on average as the best player, but the gap wouldn't have been that big. And the Brownlow result in itself, the, the distance of it, the record-breaking nature of it is, is an absurd result. I mean, to be specific, the fact that Patrick Cripps polls 45 Brownlow votes and Bontempelli polls just 19, does anyone think that Cripps is two and a half times better than Bontempelli? I know that's a very simplistic way of looking at it, but the gap between those players shouldn't have been that big. Trelaw also massively outpolling Bont. Lockie Neal, you know, uh, there was criticism of his Brownlow medal last year, at least the way that it was awarded. Many were taken by surprise, and there was a heap of flawed Brownlow votes last year. I remember, remember that was that game where Charlie Cameron kicked seven, and Lockie Neal uh, had like 21 possessions and either polled three or two, and Charlie Cameron got one. Or, uh, there was some absurd result. I did a video on it last year. But this year, the, is, it a, is it a cognitive bias? Is there an overcorrection to give Lockie Neal votes? Because him being nowhere near the top 10, same with Bontempelli, is silly. Isaac Heaney also being so far from the top. I mean, do we think there is a lot of integrity to this award if Isaac Heaney, who everyone has been saying has been the best player this year, I'm aware he had a drop off in form, but if we're talking about the integrity of a prestigious AFL midfielder award, and that's what it is, it's a midfielder award. If we're talking about its legitimacy, for Isaac Heaney to be nowhere near actually polling, well, I can't remember where he finished, but I don't think he was top five, and that, that seems absurd to me. I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at the coaches' awards, um, which is something that I've kind of championed in this video, um, and I think it is probably a better indication. Let's have a look at the results this year. So Nick Dacos won over Patrick Cripps. I'm not necessarily saying I think that should have happened in the Brownlow. I did predict Nick Dacos, but I have no concern with Patrick Cripps uh, winning the award. And of course, he, he got really close. But you do see Heaney, judged by the coaches, despite the form slump, is still a top three player in the competition. Caleb Sarong, that's about right. That's, that's, I think he polled fourth, I think, in the Brownlow. So that actually correlates. But Lockie Neal and Bont are fifth and sixth. Zach Merritt as well also did not poll that well in the Brownlow. And to say eighth best player in the comp, based on this perform this year of performance, that's probably a lot closer to being true. So straight off the bat, and this isn't subjective, it is subjective, it's my personal opinion, I think that is a little bit clearer picture of how this season went. Not necessarily the winner, but the, the names there generally. If we go back and look at the Coaches Award winners over time, um, you know, you also get an interesting picture here. So like I said, so Cripps and Neil have won four of the last five Brownlows, but you do see a much better distribution 
in the coaches award. You got, well, 16 and 17, Dangerfield and Dusty also won those brown lows, both considered two of the best individual seasons we've ever seen. So no issues there. Nice to see Max Gorn rewarded with a coach's award because, you know, as a Ruckman, the Brownlow medal is never really going to be a massive hope for that. We also see Bontempelli, who many consider one of the best midfielders to not win an award. I know that's divisive. Some people don't agree with that. My personal opinion is he's been the best player in the game for some time. So he's at least rewarded with one. Lockie Neal did win the Brownlow and the coach's award in 2020. Fair enough. We also see Clayton Oliver uh, win actually two. He's, uh, is he the only player in this time frame that I've got here that's won two? That's impressive. Took Miller was fantastic in 2022. We saw Zach Butters win it last year and Nick Dacos win it this year. So as much as anything, that just shows a little bit more distribution and some other players rewarded that are not necessarily Brownlow vote pigs. So you do see a difference here. That is how the coaches saw it. And I personally like that spread a little bit better. So what do we do about this? The thing is, like I said, the, the Brownlow medal is so deeply entrenched in our tradition that I don't expect any reasonable change to it in in our lifetime, probably. And to be honest, I am a sucker for romance and tradition, and I like Brownlow Metal Night. It is fun. But at the same time, you gotta treat it as, well, that was a fun evening. Nice to see a player rewarded. But I think we're getting increasingly further away from you know being able to say, well, this guy won two, three Brownlow medals. Therefore, he is one of the greatest players of all time. Patrick Cripps and Lockie Neal have won two each, and they are absolute stars, don't get me wrong. But I don't think their Brownlow medal wins really reflect their dominance on the competition, personally. So I guess what I'm saying is, it's not really a shot on those players, I, really, I didn't mean to do that, but what I'm saying is the Brownlow has decreasing prestige for me, and it's probably getting a little bit sillier every year. So what are some alternate voting styles that they could do? Well, I, I think because it's so deeply entrenched in our history and our tradition, that I don't imagine they'll take it away from the umpires, but what if we did it five to one? I did sort of discuss that. Let me know in the comments what you think, five to one. I honestly think the biggest reason the AFL wouldn't do that is because it would make the Brownlow longer and it, as a viewing spectacle, it would be weird to see Andrew Dillon read out, I don't know, you could have literally up to 10 players in theory get Brownlow votes. The viewing spectacle would take too long. So I actually don't think they would do that for that reason, which is lame. The West Coast Eagles club champion voting system is an interesting one that I just thought I'd throw out there because it is distinctly different. And I actually have no idea how other clubs do this, but my understanding is West Coast vote, they have five uh, judges to vote on the best and fairest every single game. Those five judges go through every single player on the field and they either reward them three, two, one, or zero votes. So that means if, if a player didn't have any impact at all, uh, they, they could get zero votes and every single player is graded individually and the best players on the field get three, but it is possible that nobody scores more than a one or a two. I think that system actually is pretty accurate. And, and as an aside, I believe that this year the West Coast Eagles finished 16th and I think I read that less than 10 players averaged five votes or more per game. So what does that mean? That means that plenty of players were scoring zeros throughout the year, and that is accurate. West Coast had a terrible year. So that sounds good. However, there is a flaw with that as well, because if a player is, you know, say best on ground for the Eagles in that particular game, he could get as many as 15 votes for a single game. The problem with that is what if a player misses a couple of weeks, and we do see this in, in the Eagles club champion award voting, there is a massive advantage to players who play every game, and a disadvantage, if you miss two games, you could lose 30 votes on an opponent, and it's much harder to claw that back. So it's not perfect either. So I suppose that that's where I put the floor to you guys. Let me know what you think about anything I've said in this video. Again, big congratulations to Patrick Cripps. I really am happy for him. I think the Brownlow is awesome as an event, I just don't think the legitimacy of this Brownlow medal is what it once was. And perhaps it was never that legitimate, but it does seem to be increasingly weird. And the results, I mean, on the one hand, there's more scrutiny than ever. We as a fan community have access to what the predictors say. So we, we already have preconceived notions about how the Brownlow is going to go. We also have more stats than ever. We can fact check these things. So maybe it's always been terribly flawed, but either way, I've said my piece, now I want to hear from you. Thanks guys, I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.